Hi there, my name is Sheridan Hansen. I'm an assistant professor of horticulture with Utah State University Extension. I'm located at the USU Botanical Center, which is about 20 minutes north of Salt Lake City, Utah. We live in the second driest state in the nation in Utah. And so we do a lot of work with plants that are drought tolerant and succulents are one of them. So I have the lucky privilege of being able to work a lot with succulents, which is what we're going to talk about today. So we have 30 minutes to really take a fun dive into the world of succulents to make you very successful at growing succulents. So this is kind of what we're gonna to touch on today, just briefly each of these categories. We're gonna talk about the benefits of succulents, some of the plant characteristics that make them so unique, um, some of the light requirements, how to select the right soil, because succulents are a little picky when it comes to their soil, and how to water them correctly, probably the greatest piece of information that you're going to learn today is how to water correctly. The temperature requirements for many of these succulents, and we're going to talk about a few of the more common problems, and we're going to touch on some of the more common succulents that you may run across when you go to the nursery to pick up one. So let's briefly touch on some of the benefits of having succulents and indoor plants in our home. And when we're talking about succulents today, we're talking about succulents that are inside, so not succulents that are outside. But one of the things about plants is they can help us to breathe easier. And that is because like people, plants have to exchange gases. So we know that people breathe in oxygen and release carbon dioxide. Plants do this, the exact opposite of what we do they take in carbon dioxide and they release oxygen. And so having an environment with enhanced oxygen levels is wonderful for us and for our health. And speaking of health, these succulents and indoor plants can improve our overall health. There have been a number of studies done on our health and how it is related to nature and to plants and animals and the things around us outdoors. And having a connection with the outdoor environment, having a plant in your office or in your home is a wonderful way for you to connect and to have all of the added benefits of decreased anxiety, decreased depression, all of these wonderful things that contribute to our overall health, including our mental health and well being. There have also been studies that show that having a house plant or an office plant can help to improve your focus. So a lot of the times we're sitting here, we're working and we get distracted and having that plant, that piece of nature next to us can help us hone in our focus and help us to be more effective at what we do. Let's look at some of the plant characteristics of succulents, why they are so unique in the plant world. Succulents come in a range of shapes, sizes, and colors. You can see that just from this photo. We have plants with pointed leaves. We have plants with yellow leaves, orange leaves, pink leaves, blue and green. They come in all different varieties. And that is what is so fun about these succulents. You can get different textures and different colors to really add to the look of what you're doing in your home or in your office. And so they are a wonderful addition that way. The thing about succulents is they come from these environments that are very difficult and harsh to live in. So they have learned to adapt to these conditions so that they can thrive in some of these harsh native environments. And one of those characteristics that is so unique to succulents is the leaves. The characteristics of the leaves of succulents are very different from many of the other plants that we encounter. The leaves are thick, they're fleshy. Um, and the reason for this is because they are typically found, the succulents are typically found in these arid, high elevation environments in places where there isn't a lot of soil, there isn't a lot of moisture. And so these plants have adapted to create these leaves that have the ability and capacity to store water for long periods of time. And when a rain event or some kind of moisture event happens, they take up that moisture, they store it in their leaves, and then they will use that moisture over a period of time to help run the process of photosynthesis and respiration so that they can put on new growth and complete all the processes that plants need to um, in order to survive and thrive. Some of their leaves can also be hairy or pubescent. Um, this is a calancho type plant um, and it has adapted to an environment with very high light and also with wind. A lot of the calanchos are found in um, places like Africa or the Middle East on high elevation cliff sides where there are not a lot of um, things that can protect them from this 
extreme sunlight and from this windy type of condition and environment. So they have created this kind of hairy covering that goes over the leaves that acts kind of like a sunscreen and will reflect some of the light that hits the leaves to keep the leaves from burning. The hairiness or the pubescence also helps to decrease some of the desiccating um, types of winds and the effects that those winds can have on our plants. So as the wind blows across this, that hair actually pushes that wind up and away from the plant leaf surface to help the plant save water and conserve water and keep the health of the leaves very high and desirable. So this is one of the ways that these plants have adapted. They're pretty cool how they work. Some of their leaves can be spiny or textured even. And that's kind of what I love about these succulents is we can get a lot of different textures, we can get a lot of different shapes, and it adds to the interest of them. So right here you can see we have a um, yucca um, type of a plant that has these spiny leaves. If you look at aloes, it's one of the characteristics of the aloes is that they have these leaf spines um, all over the leaves. And this is actually an agave. I said yucca, it's an agave. Um, so, but the aloes have spines along the leaves and the spines can be rigid and they can actually hurt when you touch them or they can be soft and flexible. But that is one of the characteristics of many of these different types of plants. So we have to create the right environment for these plants. And by creating the right environment, we can help these plants to thrive. So I wanna make sure that I get everything that I can set just right so that these plants are successful, they thrive, they're beautiful in my home. There's nothing worse than bringing home a plant and watching it slowly die. We want to make sure that these plants thrive. One of the things that we really need to pay attention to with succulents is light. Succulents require a good amount of light and they will give us cues to tell us that they're getting enough light or not enough light. Um, so a lot of the times when we have these plants, we place them near a window or we'll place them in our home. If they are getting enough light, a lot of the times they will do what's called blushing. And you can see that here on this beautiful pink aeonium. This plant is getting enough light, so it's able to take some of the carbohydrate resources that it gets from photosynthesis, and it has plenty of those resources to put towards creating some of the pigments in the plant. So this plant is going to blush, it's gonna turn pink. And a lot of the times when we see um, these colors develop, it is a cue to us that this plant is getting plenty of sunlight, good high quality sunlight. If the plant never blushes and it stays just kind of this light green color, that may be a cue that we need to put it in a little bit more intense sunlight. So we want to get these plants at least six hours of good sunlight every day, um, high quality sunlight. Now, if our plants do not have enough light, they will tell us in another way. Not only will they not blush and they won't develop colors, but oftentimes the stems will start to elongate or what we call stretch. So on the stem, you can see the stem here in the middle, and then we have leaves that come off the stems. These leaves are attached to the stem at what's called a node. And in between each node is that little stem. And when that stem between the nodes starts to elongate, the plant will start to look gangly, it will start to look leggy, it just won't look happy, it will look all stretched out, and it won't have that nice compact shape and form. So we want to make sure when we start to see these symptoms that we move the plant um, into a more um, conducive environment to promoting good growth that is not leggy. So we want to put them in a place where there is more light. So we want to place these plants typically near a window for bright light. Some windows are better than others, and that is important to understand. Uh, I typically tell people to put their plants in an east-facing window, and that is because these plants will get a good amount of bright sunlight early in the daytime when the sunlight is not so intense. As the day goes on and the sun goes towards the west, we get more and more um, high levels of radiation and that light becomes more and more intense and has the possibility to scorch or to burn our plants. And these plants can sunburn. When we get to some of the problems that we have with succulents, I'm gonna show you what sunburn looks like. So if we put these plants near an east facing window, um, usually right up next to the window is just fine. But if we start to see symptoms of sunburn, we can pull the plants away from the window just a bit. Now, if you don't have an east facing window, that's okay. South facing works great, west facing works great. We just need to pull the plants 
away from the window just a little bit, um, probably about a foot to a foot and a half away from the window, so not right up next to it. They'll still get ample amount of light, but then we won't have the sunburn problems that we often see. If you only have north facing windows, then succulents may not be the best choice for you. There is not enough light that comes through a north facing window um, to be able to support the right amount of growth and we'll have leggy plants that don't look really healthy. So there are other house plants that you can select um, that will do really well, things like pothos. There's one right behind me. Um, if you can take a pothos and you can put that in your home, it does um, give you that added benefit of having um, you know, a plant in your, in your life, that connection to nature, and it can tolerate some of those lower light levels. Let's talk a little bit about soil. Remember I said when we were doing the introduction that soil is something that these plants are a little bit picky about. And when I say picky, I mean they're not picky. It's kind of the opposite when you think about it. We want to make sure we select the right soil. If we don't select the right soil, we can set our plants up for failure very, very quickly, especially when we talk about succulents. And the reason for that is these plants are coming from these harsh, dry conditions. They usually have very sandy soil, rocky soil, soil that doesn't have a lot of nutrition in it. Um, it's kind of the worst of the worst as far as soil goes. It doesn't have a lot of organic matter in it. It doesn't hold water. It doesn't hold nitrogen, phosphorus, or potassium. So if I take my plants, my succulents, and I put them in an environment where I have created this beautiful container with potting soil that's meant for tropical plants, it has a lot of organic matter, holds water for a really long time, what do you think is going to happen to my succulents? My succulents are not going to thrive. They're actually going to die because they just can't handle that water that holds all of that moisture. So what we need to do is when we go to select a soil at the nursery or at the home center, we need to pick up what's called desert soil or cactus mix, one of those types of soils that is well um, mixed and adapted for our types of plants that don't want a lot of nutrition and don't want a lot of water. I often get asked about fertilizer. Should I be adding a bunch of fertilizer to my soil before I plant? And the answer is no, you don't need to. These plants like this very nutrient depleted type of soil. They've learned to adapt there, so they don't need a lot of nutrition. We can give our plants a little bit of fertilizer and that is just fine to do, but we only wanna do it when the plants are actively growing. And when I say actively growing, I mean in the spring, the summer and the fall. Usually with our succulents and many of our house plants, they kind of pull back on the growth in the winter months. And so we don't wanna push a lot of growth then, we wanna give the plants the opportunity to rest, to regroup, to photosynthesize, to pull in some carbohydrates before they give us a good flush of growth in the spring. And for the most part, most of the growth that we see in these types of plants happens in the spring, but we will still have some growth in summer and fall. If you are going to fertilize, you want to use a very light fertilizer. And you're going to probably want to use a water soluble fertilizer. So you'll pick up a nice water soluble fertilizer, something like a 353 or a 555. There are three numbers on the bag and those numbers represent the amount of um, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium that are available in that fertilizer for our plants. And these are what are called macronutrients. They're very important to support plant growth. So we just want to pick up something that doesn't have high numbers across the board. And then when you look at the fertilizer bag, it will tell you how to mix this in water. And we're going to take and we're going to dilute it to half of what it says. Because remember, these, these types of plants, they do not like a lot of heavy fertilizer. So if we dilute it by half, that makes it so they're getting a little bit of nutrition, but we're not over fertilizing. And then you can fertilize with that water soluble fertilizer once a month during that active growing season. So this is the most important part of this whole presentation is how to water our succulents. We want our succulents to live, we want them to thrive, we want them to survive, and guess what? We are wonderful at um, watering our plants and over watering and actually loving our plants to death. So we wanna make sure that we don't do that. When we have prolonged wet soils with some of these types of plants, specifically succulents and cactus, we can cause some serious problems. We can cause what are called root rots and that's where the roots just are sitting in water. They're not able to exchange gases. So just like leaves on a plant, 
um, they have to be able to exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide. They have to be able to move those in and out of the roots. And that's why we have things like sand down in the soil. We have these big particles of sand and those big particles make it so we can have big pockets of oxygen and carbon dioxide where we can exchange those gases down at the roots. So if the, if the soil is wet and holding water, we don't have that, that gas exchange. So it's very important that we have this nice well-draining soil and that we're not overwatering. Like I said, it's all about the gas exchange. So plants will take up carbon dioxide, they'll take the carbon from that, they'll use it in the photosynthesis process, and then they will release oxygen out into the environment. So this happens at the roots and up at the leaf surface as well, and even on stems. So how do we keep our roots healthy when we water? Um, first of all, we wanna make sure that we have the right soil, which we talked about. We wanna make sure that we select the right container, and then we wanna make sure that we're not overwatering. So we wanna select the right container. So something like an unglazed um, clay pot or terracotta pot is wonderful, and it will really support us not overwatering. And that is because the outside of this container is not glazed. So if I put water into this container, water is gonna evaporate out of the sides of the container as well as drain out of the bottom and evaporate from the soil surface up at the top. So this will help to keep my plants dry and keep that soil dry. We also need to make sure that we have good drainage. And by good drainage, that means that we're not planting in things like mason jars or containers without drainage holes. We wanna make sure that we have this lovely little hole at the bottom of our containers that allows water to drain and to drain freely and quickly with our plants. The best thing that you can do when you are watering your plants is to allow the soil to dry slightly between watering. And this means that you're probably not going to be watering even once a week. With my succulents at home, so I'm in Utah, we're a very arid environment. We don't have a lot of humidity in the air. Um, I am watering my succulents about once every seven to 10 days. And in the winter that switches down because our temperature drops. I'm only watering about every 10 to 14 days on my succulents. Now, if you're in a more humid environment and you have a lot more air humidity, your temperatures are a little more mild, they're not as hot as what we get in Utah, then your watering schedule is gonna change slightly. And that's okay. If it's more humid where you're at, you're going to stretch out that watering time even further. So you're probably not gonna water it any more than every 14 to maybe 21 days. And how you can tell is you can use the best tool that you have, and that's your finger. You take your finger and you can feel the soil and you wanna take your finger and wiggle it down into the soil and feel what the top few inches of that soil feels like. If it's nice and dry, then it's time to water. If it's not dry, then you don't wanna be watering. A lot of people ask if they can spritz their plants. And I usually tell people no on the um, succulent type of plants. You can do this with tropical plants. It's a great thing to do with tropical plants because they're used to humidity. Our succulents do not like a lot of humidity and this increases that humidity. It also leaves the, the leaf surface wet and can cause some problems with disease and, and rots on the leaves. And so we don't wanna run into that problem. Also, when we spritz, we're not deep watering and that's what these succulents need. They need infrequent deep watering. So we wanna saturate the soil, let it drain, let it dry down for a good period of time and then come back and do the same thing over. This just barely gets the soil surface wet. It's not going to saturate the soil. So avoid spritzing your plants. When we deep water, not only are we promoting you know, healthy roots, but we're also promoting the roots to go deep down into the, into the soil that we've provided. And that is going to help our plants to be even more healthy. We're gonna have good, strong, very nice and robust root systems. And this is important in having healthy plants. We want good root growth. It's better with our succulents to underwater than it is to overwater. If I have to pick one of the two, I'm gonna definitely pick underwatering as the lesser of the two evils. When we overwater, it's very difficult to bring a plant back from overwatering. Whereas if we underwater, it is easier to bring a plant back and we can take a plant back to healthy from underwatering. This is what overwatering looks like. And this is what I see a lot of people will send me pictures or they'll, they'll bring in plants to my office and say, what's going on here? 
this is definitely overwatering. And how I can tell is I have the leaves. You can see these leaves here. The leaves at the bottom are turning a different color. They're yellowing, they're falling off, they're drying, um, and they're getting kind of smooshy. So they look like they're water soaked even. And that is because they can't exchange that gas at the roots. And so the roots are starting to rot. And so in an effort for this plant to survive, it's dropping the bottom leaves and kind of reducing the load that it has to carry to keep itself healthy. This is what underwatering looks like. It looks very different. Um, you can see that the leaves are wrinkled, they're shriveled, and I can very easily take this plant back to healthy by just bumping up the water a little bit. Um, the previous plant where it was overwatered, I would probably have to repot it um, in some nice clean dry soil and really change my watering regimen to make sure that I could get that plant back to healthy and I may or may not be able to. Let's talk a little bit about temperature. So the succulents that we're talking about are tender succulents. They like to be indoors. Um, you can take them outside, but we need to do it when the temperature is correct. Um, few of these succulents will thrive in cold temperatures. And you know, I'm in Utah. We have the greatest snow on earth. I spend a lot of my time in the winter skiing. And if we have these cold temperatures and I leave my plants out, they're definitely not going to survive. If I take my plants out in the summer, and this is a gradual process taking my plants out because you can sunburn your plants going from indoors to outdoors. So you would have to take it outside, put it in dappled sunlight and eventually move it to a place where it gets about six hours of sunlight and then has some shade for the rest of the day. But they can stay outside during the spring and summer and fall months as long as our temperatures are above about 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Once we drop down below that, we can see some injury to the plant tissues and to the cells, and we don't wanna put our plants in that position because that introduces disease and makes it so that our plants don't look that great. So keeping them um, in, in a sheltered location when the temperatures drop low is very, very important. Okay, let's talk about a few of the common problems that you may see on your succulents. If you bring home a succulent, you're bound to run into this at some time. This is sunburn. I told you I would show you what sunburn looks like, and this is it. You can see it really does look burned. Like this plant went to the beach, I forgot its sunscreen, and it looks like it just got fried. Um, I've done this personally, where I've taken a plant from my inside of my house and taken it outside, and I forgot to kind of move it gradually. And this is exactly what happened to my plant. Now you can see in the center of this rosette that I've got some good, nice green growth there. And I can let this plant continue to grow. It's not going to kill this plant, but the new growth will look much better. The old growth will still look sunburned. I can't fix that, I can't recover it. So just remember as you move plants in and out of your homes, of your offices to do it gradually and to not put them in a situation where they, the light intensity is so high that they get burned. This can also happen inside on those south and west facing windows. So be careful on how you position your plants near those windows. Mealy bugs are probably one of the most common problems that I see with succulents. This is an insect. Um, it looks kind of a, like a funky little insect. It's got these little appendages that stick off of its body. They're not legs, they're just these little appendages, um, kind of feelers, if you will. And the, they're white, they kind of look dusty. They can create this kind of sticky cottony substance around them, so sometimes if you touch the sticky cottony substance, it will stretch kind of like cotton candy, um, but don't eat it, that's not good. Um, these insects can be very difficult to get rid of and they can spread from plant to plant quickly. So if you see these on a plant, and I usually check my plants every time I water, so that's every 10 to 14 days, somewhere in there, I'm checking my plants and making sure that I don't see any of this kind of problem. Um, once you see this problem, you need to isolate the plants that you find it on. Um, we just had an outbreak of mealybugs in one of our greenhouses at the USU Botanical Center and it spread quickly through a number of plants throughout the greenhouse. So you have to isolate and you have to take care of the problem. How you can treat this, um, horticultural um, oils, very light oils, insecticidal soaps can also help. Um, you can find these at your local nurseries, greenhouses, um, home centers will also have them. You can even resort to, the, there are insecticides for house plants, just make sure that they are labeled and registered for use on indoor plants. 
A lot of people will use rubbing alcohol on these. They'll dilute the rubbing alcohol to 25% strength. So one part alcohol to three parts water. And then you can spray down the plant with a spray bottle and that will get the alcohol down in every little nook and cranny and will kill the mealy bugs. A lot of the time the mealy bug infestation will be down in the soil as well. So you may have to take out your plants shake off as much of the soil as you can. If you see them down in that area, put them in a new clean pot and put new potting soil, that desert mix potting soil in there and get, get that cleaned up. And you'll want to keep these plants isolated for a while and then monitor to make sure that they're not coming back. Spider mites are another really common one that we run into. Um, these, these types of insects, they're not even insects, they're actually arachnids. They are related to spiders. They have eight legs and they are web spinning. So you can see here, if you look very closely at this picture, we have some webbing coming off of the leaves. And that's what you'll see. You'll see little, what looks like spider webs. And then you'll see these little tiny dots moving back and forth on the spider webs. They're very, very tiny. And they come in a bunch of colors. You can have red, you can have black, you can have yellow, you can have tan. They come in that range of colors. And um, once they start to, to show up, they can multiply quite quickly. They like dry, dusty conditions. And what do we have with succulents? Very dry conditions. Um, you can usually spray them off with a very strong stream of water. So if you have a sprayer in your kitchen sink, you can take your plant and you can spray it off with that stronger stream of water. That will knock them off. You can again treat with an insecticide that's labeled for indoor plants, or you can use the, the insecticidal soap horticultural oils um, that are labeled for indoor. And then again, you can try the rubbing alcohol trick. That usually works very well. These are piercing sucking insects. All of these are the, the spider mites, the mealy bugs. The next one I'm gonna show you, which is scale. These plants all have this piercing sucking mouth part, which is like a straw that goes into the leaf and sucks out the sap from the plant and it will eventually weaken the plant and kill the plant. So we do need to take care of these problems. So this is scale. Scale often shows up on things like aloes, tougher leaved types of plants that can handle um, a little bit tougher insect. Um, scale are actually quite fascinating. They have what's called a crawler stage where they do not have this armored shell. So you can see the armored shell that kind of looks like an oyster on the side of this plant. And um, yuccas, agaves, um, aloes, these, will, these are all kind of prone to this scale. And when they're crawling, they don't have that, that, that hardened covering and they can move up and down the plant. And that's the best time to treat them. And that's usually in the spring. Once they kind of settle down and they find a place where they wanna put their mouth parts into the plant and start feeding, then that's when they start to develop that hard shell, that outside coating on top of themselves. And they become much more difficult to treat once they have that coating on them. You have to use um, some kind of systemic insecticide that is labeled for indoor plants at that point so that it's up inside the plant and as the scale feeds, it actually kills the scale. Some people will take a toothpick and just very carefully scrape the scale off, um, but they're pretty much impenetrable to anything being sprayed on them from the outside once they've created the shell. And they will lay eggs underneath the shell and then the crawler stage will happen again in about a year in the spring. So scale can be a little bit harder to get rid of. We often see it on citrus plants too, um, a number of house plants that are kind of tougher and can handle a tough insect like scale. Let's run through a few common succulents. We're gonna do this kind of quickly. Um, the more sunshine you see on these, the more light it needs, the more water droplets you see, the more water it needs. So that's just kind of a key for you. Echeveria is known for being this beautiful rosette that comes with these ruffly leaved um, type variations and also with pointed ends on the leaves. So you can see those pointed ends here. They come in a range of colors, pinks, purples, blues, greens, and they're very delicate. These are plants that easily stretch if they don't have enough light. Cotyledon is known for these thick and wide leaves that are very, very fleshy. They're sometimes called paddle plants. They need some very, very bright light. So they are, they are light lovers. And um, they have this just interesting look about them with that nice fat paddly plant type look. 
Crass yellow, you may know by a different name. This one's called jade as well. So if you've ever had a jade plant, um, it's a crassula. It goes into this family. Crassulas, um, they tend to do very well. They're survivors. They can go a long period of time without water. I moved um, from one house to another, forgot about my jade plant, didn't water it for six months, saw it and went, oh no. And it looked like it had never missed a watering. It looked just fine. Gave it some water. It started to thrive again. Everything was fine. So they can go a long period of time without water. So if you're a person that travels a lot, you're not home, you may want to pick up a jade. Or if you're one of those people like me that forgets to water every now and then, this is a really good selection for you. They have these intricately patterned leaves. You can see how the leaves line up. They're absolutely beautiful. They come in just a wide variety of colors and shapes and sizes. Things that you wouldn't think would be related to each other are related in that family. A lot of the times we'll see calanchos in the grocery store. They have these very brightly blooming um, clusters on them. So they'll come in oranges and yellows and whites and pink and red, purple, pretty much every color you can imagine calanchos come in. They can be difficult to rebloom. And so you have to put them in a dark closet for 14 hours a day and that light can't, or that darkness can't be interrupted. We can't open the door and let light in during that period of time. And then they can be let out into the sunlight for the remainder of 10 hours that day. And um, once they start to form blooms, you do this for like six weeks. Once they start to form blooms, then you can bring them back out of the closet, let them have just normal, regular light and they will continue to bloom. But they can be a little bit tricky as far as rebloom, but they're a fun one for if you've never had um, something that's brightly blooming like this in your house. And the, the blooms do last for quite a while. So it's a good, it's even a good plant to gift to somebody. Graptopatalum, this is um, also known as Mexican ghost plant. And the reason it's called a ghost plant is because it has this kind of waxy coating on the outside of the leaves that mutes the colors. So if it's a pink or a purple or a blue or a green, and then it has that, wa that waxy coating on the outside, it makes it these gorgeous muted colors. These tend to have the leaves that pop off very easily. They're very brittle. So this is a plant that I say, set it and forget it. Put it down where you want it to be, plant it into your container, and then don't touch the leaves because um, not only will they pop off, but that waxy layer on the outside will also rub off and it will start to look, you know, like you've handled it too much. So a really cool, fun plant if you like those muted colors. Of course, we have the aloes. This one is uh, medically significant. It's one of those plants that we have a lot of things that we want to use out of this plant. So that, um, you know, that gel, we also often think of that gel inside those leaves as something to soothe sunburns. I know a lot of people that have um, aloe drinks and they, they say it's greatly beneficial for your body. So we can definitely add aloes. And if you're in a location where you don't freeze in the winter, you can have aloes outside and in your plantings. And that's a wonderful thing to do if you can, if you can add that to your landscape. So if you have questions, um, I'm happy to take your emails. I'm happy to answer questions that you may have. You can reach me at sheridan.hanson at usu.edu. And thanks so much for watching. I hope you learned a lot about succulents and how to take care of them. And I hope that you're successful in your succulent endeavors from here on out. Thanks so much and happy gardening.